Right. At the very outset, <clears throat> I must thank Dr. Agnesh and Dr. Siddharth for <clears throat> sorry, providing this opportunity to share my thoughts on this particular topic, which is slightly closer to my heart. I do, do a routine. It is trauma is one of uh, the routine bread and butter and also the passion for me. IT factor in particular, so today's topic is, is DHS still an option? So why this debate? I mean, the learning outcome from this topic hopefully is going to be why this debate at all, if at all, and what are the indication of DHS? Is Are there any indication in today's world? Is there any contraindication? And if there are indication, what are the tips and tricks to have a successful outcome? What are likely complication? What does literature say about it? it and a few case examples to support that. <clears throat> so why this debate? Well, first of all, I need to tell you all, IT fracture are growing in number and day by day, this is going to grow like anything because age, the longevity is increasing because the quality of life is improving. So life expectancy is obviously going high. That also means the osteoporosis rise on rise. And these fractures are going to be rampant. DHS is becoming slight less favorite implant these days. So that is also the reason this debate is there because the PFN, the more fashion is because drifting towards PFN. But the question is here, is it just based on some evidence or it is actually supported by robust evidence? But unfortunately the answer is, there's no robust evidence to support that the DHS is out of fashion and PFN is the implant of the choice. If you go through the literature or otherwise through the series worldwide, there are few surgeons who are still sticking only to the DHS. Whereas there are few surgeons who are completely doing PFN for everything and anything. And there are a few lots like me, or perhaps they are mixed at time they are doing PFN and at time they are doing DHS. So this is the reason the debate is there. When we talk of the fracture, this today's topic is mainly limited to trochanteric fracture and which we talk of excluding the cervical, which is neck fracture and the subtrochanteric fracture. So what a fracture in this region, that essentially is the trochanteric region and starting from cervical trochanter to the subtrochanteric area. And <clears throat> there the debate is which implant is better and if it is DHS, why, when, and when not. First of all, when we talk of intertrochanteric fracture, as a matter of routine, we apart from the other classification, we have to classify whether this fracture is stable or unstable. So very simple, when there's a lesser trochanter and lateral wall, both of them are intact, two part fracture, it is a stable fracture. When either of them is broken, whether lesser trochanter, posterior middle fragment, or the lateral wall is broken, that means it's unstable fracture. So this is most important first classification to just grossly understand what the fracture you are dealing with and what implant you can be using. When you talk of implant, <clears throat> essentially the treatment of child for this fracture is surgery. Absolutely, there's no role of conservative treatment, irrespective of the age, irrespective of the comorbidities, irrespective of the unfitness status and kind of thing. As of today, 99% are should get operated unless until there is a huge risk for anesthesia and anesthetics is not happy to at all take out. Otherwise, these patients should be operated even if the longevity is less even if the patient has bed bone, just for the nursing care, they should get operated. And that's the only treatment actually. Otherwise, they're going to get bed sores, they're going to get complication, their quality of life is going to become miserable. The quantity may get slightly prolonged, but quality will become miserable. So hence, it is the treatment of child's is surgery. And at time, the implant wise, mainly is osteosynthesis, but you may have to also think in terms of replacement as well. At times in a very osteoporotic, comminuted, unstable, cervical token fracture. So the, just to be aware of that this is just the debate is not only DHS, PFN, but at time replacement option can be there as well. When we talk of implants, otherwise osteosynthesis, the main debate is between PFN, the intramedullary uh, implant and the DHS, the extramedullary implant. However, extramedullary can be condylar plate plate, can be uh, proximal femoral locking plate, DCS, or maybe rarely external fixator as well. So what are the goal of, goals of the treatment for this fracture? The primary goal, main goal is adequate and stable reduction. Mechanically, it should be adequate fixation 
and it should permit early weight bearing. Reason for that is because if you're going to pre uh, prevent the patient from weight bearing, early weight bearing, essentially the whole purpose of surgery get defeated. What you want at the end of the day is immediate start mobilization so that the prolonged bed bone complication in this age group can be avoided. And moreover, these are the patients who are not going to be mobilizing with the non-weight bearing because they are frail patient. They have to be either non uh, completely bed rest or working with full weight bearing. You cannot mobilize with them partial weight bearing or non-weight bearing. So the, your fixation has to be stable. So what are the prerequisite requisite for a successful outcome in these fractures? The prerequisite is you need to have a correct indication and correct implant to choose. The quality reduction is of paramount importance. And of course, your medical techniques is important and one must preserve the biology as much as possible because there's no replacement, particularly when we are talking of osteosynthesis. So what are the correct indication? I'm sticking mainly towards the DHS. So DHS, what are the correct indication for DHS? So essentially any stable fracture, which I already defined is a straightforward indication for DHS, safely can be treated by DHS without any problem. And it's still a gold standard implant for these fractures. Question happened in case of unstable fracture where the lateral wall is intact, my choice of treatment will be DHS again. The main criteria is lateral wall intact may be unstable, maybe there may be posterior medial fragment, there are lesser trochanter is off, there's a combination, cervical trochanter fracture, still they should go, one can easily safely treat with DHS. It is also supported by the literature and it says the integrity of the lateral wall, femoral wall in intertrochanter fracture is predictor, predictor of the outcome. Actually, if the lateral wall is broken, that means the successful outcome is not going to be there. And if it is intact, and if you can keep it intact intraoperatively, postoperatively as well, that means the likely outcome of uh, positive outcome is much better. When you talk of classification, you know that there are various classification like Evans, Boyd's and Griffiths, and, Griffith, and, and then O and OTO classification. When you talk of Evans classification type one, two, four, this is one lateral wall intact, two lateral wall intact, four lateral wall intact, safely can be treated by DHS. Whereas type three, where the lateral wall is broken, type five, the lateral wall is broken, the uh, treatment of choice is not DHS. When you talk of Boyd and Griffin's classification, type one and two, which is these two, lateral wall intact, can be safely treated by DHS, whereas type three and four, lateral wall broken, cannot be treated by DHS. When you talk of AO and OTA classification, A1, A2, safely DHS, lateral wall is intact, A3, lateral wall is broken, Subtrochanter extension, reverse trochanter fracture cannot be treated by DHS. Few examples, indication, stable fracture, safely DHS, no issues. Lesser trochanter broken, again, lateral wall intact, safely treated DHS. Unstable, commutator fracture, but lateral wall intact, DHS can be safely the treatment option. Again, stable fracture, more or less DHS. DHS for this posterior middle large chunk, but still, very well can be treated by DHS. What are the other indications for DHS to, so to say, because DHS, we are talking of this. Other indication of basic cervical fracture apart from intertrochanter fracture can be easily treated by DHS. Apart from that, you can add derotation screw. At time, in the case of fracture neck of femur intracapsular, where you have to do velcus or statement because of the increased uh, power angle, the chance of non-union more, you have to do a primary valgus well, that means the DHS is, can be implanted. At time, rarely in case of subtrochanter fracture, though that's not the implant of choice, kneeling is the implant of choice, but you have may have to do DHS. Here you can do, use DHS, subtrochanter fracture though, but from entry point, distally there should be at least one centimeter intact bone. So entry point would be somewhere at the top of the lesser trochanter, the one centimeter is still intact, so safely can be used, DHS can be used rather than DCS. So this is another situation. So what are the contraindications? The main contraindication is breach of the lateral wall. Like the fracture, these kind of fractures and treatment of choice is not DHS. If at all you have to really use, you may have to supplement it with a TSP, token destabilizing plate. Not a good news for DHS, not a fracture for DHS. Not a fracture again for DHS not a fracture for DHS. If you see on the right side, this side, the subtrochanter, there is a lateral wall breach, not DHS. On this side, the lateral wall is intact. You can safely go ahead with the DHS. So coming to, from that background, 
to do a successful DHS, what are the tips and tricks? Essentially, it starts with the pre-op planning and you need to have a good pre-op planning to have a good intraoperative and post-operative outcome. And that starts with adequate pre-op x-rays. Very, very important. When you talk of pre-op x-rays, you need to have pelvis bilateral hip, not a unilateral hip. With AP and cross leg uh, lat table, lateral view of involved proximal femur with, of course, the hip joint. It's very important to have traction, gentle traction and internal rotation view because that's going to define the fracture because if you see here, perhaps the other is just talking about busy cervical type of fracture, but if you see here, there's a huge difference. The same patient, traction, internal rotation, indifference outcome was DHS actually. If you see here, cervical trochanter, but after traction and internal rotation safely can be treated by DHS. X-ray a pelvis with bilateral hips, why it is important because you need to see of the neck shaft angle on the opposite side. If you see here, the neck shaft angle is the coxa velga and you may have to reproduce it on the opposite side. So you need to know on the bilateral side. And just quickly to remind you that normally the angle is 130 to 135 degree, 135 degree angle plate you are mostly going to use, but you can have coxa vera, significant coxa vera is of course less than 110 degree neck shaft angle and coxa velga is more than 140 degree. And that is the reason you need to know that opposite side because you, there are various angle plates also available. And based on that, you can use that and you can reproduce that. Full length shaft of femur, X-ray, especially in patient with pathological intracapsular neck of femur, or for that matter, mainly intertrochan fracture. If there is a pathological fracture suspected, you must have X-ray of the whole limb. And there, perhaps the nail is better rather than the edges. Then latest and fresh x-ray, very important. Just from the day before yesterday, actually, I had encountered actually, this was 10 days previous x-ray, more or less okay seems. I thought DHS is going to be my treatment of choice. Got latest x-ray rotation as been our setup. Patient perhaps went to the DC massage after that weight bearing, this, that, and neck was smashed actually after that, absolutely no clue. Actually, the neck was obviously the not, perhaps not a case for osteosynthesis. And intraoperatively, I tried to convince myself whether I can reconstruct or not, but there was hardly any bone in this area. Actually, the whole neck is a reserved type of kind of within a few days, actually. So you need to have a latest updated X-ray to see and to plan. It's not a previous X-ray. You should not be relying on X-ray, which is done even 10 days or two weeks ago. Ideally, the target of these patients should be to operate within 48 hours, of course, up to, after proper optimization. Though these are not intercapsular neck of femur fracture in young patient where you are worried about avian, but here you are worried about the comorbidity, you are worried about the complication of the bad bone complication. These patients are very fragile. They've got multiple medical problems. Essentially, what they say is, this is incidental fracture in a patient with multiple comorbidities. They, the comorbidities are going to deteriorate the moment the patient is going to be prolonged bed, bedridden for a few days. So it has to be early mobilization, early optimization, and early operating. So then next is patient is obviously going to be taken to theater and you start with the fracture reduction. Obviously you're going to take in on the fracture table, C arm under the C arm, opposite leg out of the way so that you can have a proper AP and the lateral view of the affected hip and proximal femur. When you talk of reduction, more or less the simple, simply traction, gentle traction, slight abduction and internal rotation usually reduces the fracture. However, few cases really you may have to increase the external rotation to unlock the fracture and then pull it distally and rotate it, it internally. This is called a little bit of maneuver. So that can uh, help into reducing the fracture. Posterior sagging at time, the fracture can be reduced in AP, but the lateral view, there will be posterior sagging. So you can reduce it by gently pushing it up, or maybe there is crutches available, there's intraoperative, you can keep it placed there just to avoid, uh, prevent that sag. But however, at times, you have to, whenever you are doing, obviously, DHS, you put a, just a lever gently under the distal fragment, of course, preserving, uh, taking care of sciatic nerve and other stuff. So gently, just one of the assistant or you at time, just are going to lift it up and everything's going to be uh, corrected. And then you can insert a guide wire. And one guide wire can be just a uh, sort of uh, reduction wire. In undisplayed fracture, not much reduction, slight internal rotation is needed. However, you must check your reduction for fracture displacement, the neck shaft angle, the antiversion, the femoral shaft sag, and rotation clinically, if at all. 
only gentle one point is very important only gentle traction and control reduction it's not we should be forceful reduction it should not be forceful traction easily the fracture can get converted into somehow into subtrochanter fracture and you will be trouble and that will become a contraindication for dhs you are all prepared for doing a dhs but there you realize the fracture is converted to subtrochanter extension and everything is fallen in out of your hands so quality of reduction is very important if you fail to achieve close reduction don't hesitate to go for open reduction but quality of reduction almost anatomical has to be done avoid you must avoid varus and the sagging do not proceed unless adequate reduction which may be even open as i told you already at time after open opening you may have to put a clamp but you have to be very careful these are very protic you cannot be applying a sharp clamp and tightening it because that's going to you can create easily extra fracture or also in the putting medially the neurovascular structures are also there so you have to be slightly more careful uh which approach of course lateral approach but um, it has to be centered not too proximal actually in the proximal end of the incision should be just at the tip of the uh greater trochanter you can uh, in the obese patient you can get guided by the c arm distally the limb should be uh, the the limb of incision should be slightly anterior because if it is completely lateral then at time you fall more posterior because there is limb sh yeah, sh the incision should be aligned into the shaft of the femur you can palpate if you want of course the incising the skin sub subcutaneous tissue and fascia and then you go with the uh, vastus lateralis there are multiple approaches to the vastus lateralis you may split in the middle you better is to just to lift it from the posterior aspect and uh, then just reflect it in, in, interiorly there's no need to cut in l shape that was originally described in the books actually that's not required at all because that's going to invite more bleeding more cumbersome in the closing and obviously rehabilitation is also slow so just you need to lift it across anteriorly and adequate access can be obtained and moreover this uh, muscle is going to fall back and not need needed much of the closure anyways afterwards the next step is going to be after prepping draping the start and open your approach is done actually and then guide wire insertion guide wire insertion should always be guided by angle guide there are two types of guides available one is a fixed guide the prefer preferability is a variable gu angle guide because you don't know about the next shaft angle anyways so that you can adjust and based on this you can put in the angle plate accordingly uh when you talk of guide wire insertion invariably you start at the superior part of the lesser trochanter and with the help of angle guide you obviously aim at the center of the femoral head center of the neck both in ap and lateral views and if you have to increase the angle for example by 5 degree you must you can you should move 5 degree distally uh, otherwise this is going to be quite superior plate uh, wire once you insert it into go in in ap view around 1 to 2 uh, cm in and then swing over to the lateral view and then keep guiding into the lateral view and once you are through into lateral view and proper if at all there is slight variation up and down keep the wire intact in and the next wire is going to be parallel to that based on whatever whether it is superior you need superior or inferior but the target should be in the center center in both views and you should just stop somewhere in subcondral region 5 mm proximal or distal to the articular surface actually you should not cross the joint because uh, because the moment you cross the joint actually at times what can happen rarely the wire can break after using the triple reamer and that is the worst situation however you may have to use another wire before passing on this wire especially in case of unstable fractures where you have to put a wire superiorly and anterior or posterior which should not be coming in the way of this wire or the triple reamer and this wire if the fracture is especially cervical trochanter unstable fracture where chances of rotations are there you can wire pass on this wire perhaps across the joint as well because that's going to lock this fragment and subsequently obviously you are going to remove it but be very careful about this wire in particular so once the wire is settled then of course another thing is angle guide what i realize is if you just this is angle guide if you just push the, the distal limb or the pin of this tooth of the guide closer to the shaft at time what happens is the guide wire will go superiorly 
and and also by keeping just half a centimeter away from the shaft the moment you're going to put in plate this is going to be slight in valgus and that's what you want that's what you need and moreover the wire is going to be in the center by keeping this slightly off so don't not necessarily always to be touching this is obviously the example of the guide wire. At time, you can put an anti-virgin wire entirely, but not necessarily always needed actually, because you got beautiful these days, CRMs and everything is available. Previously, that was used to be whenever there's a portable X-rays were uh, needed to do DHS, but no, it is, that's not needed. If you're told you have to do a DHS for a subtrochanter fracture, ensure that at least one centimeter intact lateral wall below the leg screw entry point, otherwise, the whole purpose get defeated. So one centimeter of intact lateral wall has to be there below the entry point of the lag screw after insertion, the lag screw entry point. Ensure the guide wire insertion in a proper neck shaft angle, center center in both views, like this center in the both views, the center. So this is what the guide wire should be looking at. Then of course you measure, the measure the depth Obviously, you are going to be inserting the screw and by this. This is indirect. You can have two types of measurement. This is a proper scale, invariably available in DHS. So here, you, this is just going to be touching under the bone. And there, the, reamer, the reading on this will be about the length of this wire inside. Or else, you can just put another wire just here along with this wire and just subtract and measure it with a normal scale as well. So that is going to tell you the length of the wire and ideally the wire you're measuring is just five millimeter subcontrol area and that is going to give you the length. And then you have to decide because why it is important, this is going to decide your lag screw length, this is going to decide your triple lemur length and also the tap length. To calculate the books, this is generally written in the books, direct measuring, for example, there is a 105 millimeter, you subtract 10 for telescoping and a bit of collapse and reamer set is triple reamer set at 90 millimeter, 95 millimeter, which means 10 degree minus tap length, tapping length, uh, uh, the tap length is going to be 95 and the screw is going to be 95 same. However, what I do generally, I don't do like this and invariably fortunately good results. What I do is guide wire five millimeter subcontrol measure, for example, the length is coming 90 millimeter. I'll take the screw length as an 85 millimeter, but here the, there is a catch actually. What I do is I normally I just subtract five millimeter. I don't subtract nine, uh, 10 millimeter, but trimmer, triple trimmer I increase in this case, for example, uh, the length was 85 of the screw. So I'm going to use 95 in normal quality bone and in case of stable fracture. Whereas 100 is going to be my triple trimmer in case of community unstable and poor quality bone. There is a reason for that. Because what I don't want is I don't want to use the triple part of the reamer. I just want to use the double part of the reamer. And absolutely, there's no problem invariably faced by me. So far, insertion of the barrel of the plate is concerned because essentially the idea of triple reamer is that the barrel of the plate should be inserted easily. Otherwise, it's not going to be. So that is the reason because why I do this is because I want to preserve my lateral wall. Because intraoperatively, if you're not careful and if you use triple reamer, invariably you end up damaging, shattering the lateral wall and essentially day one almost failure type of start, situation collapses and the fractures will start medializing. The shaft is going to be medial and uh, uh, not a very good situation will happen. You also need to be aware of that. There are long barrel and short barrel uh, triple limer available. And I'll be coming to the long barrel and short barrel plate and afterwards uh, anyways. So use only double reamer at most attempt to avoid lateral wall shattering. Very, very important. If from my lecture, if you take away, should be this part actually, because this is the tip of uh, the crux of the matter actually. Preserve the lateral wall. And the way of preserving lateral wall is avoid triple reaming. Use only double reaming and try to increase length of triple reamer rather than decreasing it. So for them, for example, if you use triple reamer, obviously this part is going to be shattered because these are osteoporotic bones. They are not very thick. And essentially there's a predictor you need to be in the one of the, in the literature that there is some uh, typical like measurement of the lateral wall length uh, width, and that is going to predict it that is uh, for the failure or for avoiding shattering. And that's very difficult to actually objectively 
measure interoperability is what is the length, uh, what is the width of the, the bone and what is the diameter. The next is very important, the tip apex distance. In the both views, AP and lateral view, the, if the distance from the tip of the screw to the uh, articular surface, that in combination should not be less than 15 and should not be more than 25. So it should be between 15 and 25 when you combine them. Reason for that is if the tear tip apex distance is beyond 25 degrees, the failure rate is going to be more the chances of failure increases. Wherever if it is under 25, the failure approach is almost zero. So very important actually, your screw has to be just into the subcondral area. It should not be too short. Otherwise the failure, the cutout and everything is going to be high. So tip apex distance is then essentially another very important criteria apart from that it should be center center. Like this, it should be in the just the tip apex distance, more or less in AP and lateral in the center center. So very important for reading. Another thing is when you come of instrumentation further, the tap, if in the strong bone, you have to use tap. Whereas in very osteoporotic, there is hardly any need for using the tap. But whenever you're using tap, you must use the center sleeve along with the tap. Otherwise there will be eccentric tapping. And this is, there is also in the, on the tap, there will be like, there's a major actually the gauge is there. That you have already measured the length, for example, the 90 was there, so you should not be crossing that. Of course, you must be checking under the C arm, and especially while you're doing the triple reamer over the guide wire, you must check in between because at time the wire, especially if it's multiple used wire, that can be pushed across the joint. So it's always better to keep checking under the C arm, otherwise the wire will get pushed. Uh, next is you have to make the assembly. The lag screw, you have selected the length. There is a coupling device which comes with in the set. You must use it always. And on the top of that, the wrench, the screw inserted driver is going to be inserted. And that should be inserted through the center sleeve so as to have a centralizing effect. The reason for that, the effect of the importance of this combination is the sliding of plate will become very easy at time, even in a wheeze position. For example, at, at time, the screw is slightly under the bone may not be fully visible on the laterally, which is which should not be prominent, it should be just be proud, just be touching the lateral wall, and your insertion of plate is going to be very straightforward. Otherwise, you just struggle inserting the barrel of the plate, and at time you may have to do some rotation or insert it other way around and then twist around, and that can cause easily shattering, that can cause fracture, and that can be very uh, tedious as well. So it's always better to, to make this assembly, try to use these instruments to your advantage. Every DHS set has got these instruments available. So important aspect is the appropriate size of flag screw. It should not be too long. It should not be proud from the lateral aspect as well, because that is going to also, after the sliding of the plate, the screw is going to become prominent and that's going to be impinging on the lateral surface. Everything heals, but the patient is going to be having a huge pain. Avoid rotation of the head neck fragment while inserting screw. Because at time, if you're not careful, you can easily rotate this fracture. The next is uh, alignment of the uh, handle. The handle has to be aligned laterally in the parallel to the shaft. Because if you're not going to be doing that while inserting the screw, the aligning the plate is not going to be easy for you. Next is, uh, as I told you, that it has to be parallel to the shaft. Otherwise, the difficulty will be seating of the plate. Like this is the position ultimately of the wrench T handle uh, T should be. Then after that, you remove the wrench and then slide the appropriate DHS plate onto the guide shaft, which I already told you, uh, until it reaches the lateral surface of the uh, femur. Loosen and remove the coupling screw and guide shaft, and then we draw your guide wire. The plate selection based on barrel length. The standard barrel length is 38 millimeter. You need to be aware of this and standard majority of time it is the angle is 135 degrees. Why it is important is because the, the length of the barrel and the screw is, you need to allowing a control collapse to act as a dynamic action, which reduces the incidence of screw cutout and penetration of screw into the hip joint. You also need to be aware of that, that these wires, this uh, plate, they come in short and long barrel. 
if it is less than if the screw length is less than 85 millimeter or 85 millimeter you should be using a short barrel plate if it is more than 85 millimeter you should be using a standard barrel why because the thread length is 22 millimeter recommended gliding uh, sliding is 25 millimeter minimum at least 10 millimeter it should be sliding standard barrel length is 38 millimeter and whereas in short barrel it is 25 millimeter so if you combine 22 millimeter which is a thread length minimum collapsing required uh, gliding sliding is 25 and plus the length of the ba uh, barrel is 38 so that combines 85 that is the reason the 85 is the magic number so hence you should be clear whenever you using 85 mm of lag screw or less than that you should be using short barrel plate and if you are using more than that you should be using normal standard long barrel plate this is the way it should be when you easily sliding this is the coupling device which is uh, still in place with the lag screw and easily the plate is slided on the top of that so no struggle so far as in search enough plate is concerned and then you just gently hammer it with a punch to, uh, so that the, the plate will touch the lateral aspect of the femur but be very careful do not hammer it very hard these are mind you these are very osteoporotic bone though the one fracture is visible obvious but there may be at times subtle sub uh, fracture which are not very obvious and the moment you are push bit more hard and it's easily because you have reamed also this area is already weak there can be easily subtrochanter fracture somewhere here and this fracture the whole fragment will start medializing the whole purpose get defeated and the, your uh, malunion and uh, other stuff is going to be there at time you may have to use a clamp but again be very careful uh, fix the plate to the femur with a 4.5 mm cortical screw avoid forceful seating of the plate never ever do this if that is the case you may have to change intraoperator the angle of the plate because these days the 125 130 135 or 140 degrees are easily available in all the sets and if you are forcing you can easily create a subtrochanter fracture again that is going to be disastrous situation for but rarely unfortunately you can have then you have to use maybe i mean if you do not have any other implant which you at this stage perhaps you may not be able to use you may have to use a longer plate and you may have to use tsp to keep the lateral wall intact and of course the longer plate as well you must insert the second last which is the second distal most screw first and then the most proximal screw reason for that is if you insert the proximal screw first you are not aware of fully about the distal aspect of the plate whether this is off the femur or not but if you insert the second last screw and then you are almost sure that plate is fully seated and also on the dead center lateral aspect of the femur and that's not a problem this is the way ideally the plate should be looking at and the screws and everything stand nicely seating then next is the compression screw again there is a debate normally most of the cases you don't need to insert the compression screw especially in stable fracture there is when there is no distraction and all wherever if at all you have to use the compression screw it is just come intraoperatively you loosen the traction you insert the compression screw and then you just remove it however in case of very unstable fracture keep it intact because that is going to prevent the disengagement really of uh, the barrel and screw otherwise that can happen so you can keep the screw intact in case of very unstable fracture otherwise you have to remove it dhs has already told you can we have extended indication in intracapsular neck of femur as well where you can use should you de rotation screw first and followed by dhs and of course you are using a smaller plate two hole or one hole plate uh, two hole is invariably is good enough at time you may have to use tsp trochanter stabilizing plate especially in case of where you are using it for subtrochanter fracture or there is a for example community trochanter fracture you have to use trochanter fracture the screws for trochanter fracture rarely or maybe de rotation screw also through that tsp can be used it is invariably used for screw fixation of the greater trochanter and also for anti rotation screw and invariably if at all you have to use this is for unstable per trochanter fracture slightly uh, smaller letters for sorry for that the debate is whether to use long plate or short plate invariably 3 to 4 hole plate is good enough more longer plates obviously mean more dissection complicate the future surgery no improvement in proximal purchase inherent instability of the fracture and reduction is not altered 
However, the reduces, it does reduce to some extent the tensile forces on the proximal two screws, but no additional protection and same rate of failure. So no need for using too long plate. So in summary, technical consideration, pre-operative, you must have proper AP and traction internal rotation X-rays with opposite hip and of course the lateral view. Peripherally only gentle control traction and reduction, quality reduction, it may be closed or open, avoid various and sagging, do not proceed unless until you get uh, full proper reduction. Center center placement of screw, tip apex distance is very, very important. So everything is not so good, good. There can be complications as well. If you're doing to do surgery, it's, it's complications are part of the game. Most commonly like screw cutout, screw barrel disengagement. This is an example for the medialized distal fragment, uh, the collapse. This is screw cut out, broken trochanter, perpetrator, perhaps there was shattering, screw barrel disengagement, hardware broken because of the various, again, completely medialized distal fragment, proximally the screw is out. Again, collapse, significant greater trochanter, broken, significant medialization, lateral bar completely breached, both in AP and lateral malunite, not an acceptable position at all. This another case, medialized, but thanks to Terry Parrotite, most probably I think there's a lot of callus and patient was doing completely fine. Having said that, complication is though happens in DHS, but your counterpart, which is PFN, is also not immune to the complication. And look at these examples. There's a classical Z effect you are all aware of. There can be reverse Z effect. Uh, another complication after this was the initial x-ray, subsequent some completely lysis and intercapsular type of neck of femur fracture, all fracture at the tip. Another situation, poor quality bone, not a problem of any implant, another example. So why DHS? There must be some advantages, but that's the reason I'm advocating DHS. Familiar implant, it is familiar to all of us. The jigs are very familiar and technique is very familiar. We have been doing this. We've been trained doing this. Easy availability of various angle barrel plate, 125 degree, 130, 135, 140 degree, technically much easier. Open reduction if required can be easily done through the same approach. For example, lateral wall, lateral view, it is completely off. You can easily just reduce putting one lever proximally and one distally. You can approximate the fracture. It is reproducible, it can be done by every surgeon in any setup, significantly cheaper. That's a very important, it's significantly cheaper in any setting, be it in develop, developing world, cost is a factor actually, and it's a significant cheaper. Perhaps a wide shattering in case of associated with trochanter fracture, per trochanter fracture, for example, if it is associated, if you insert a nail, there can be more shattering. At time, it's a busy cervical fracture, can lead to further, the nail can lead to further displacement and the easily the fracture can go into various. So it can be avoided by using DHS. Not a significant difference so far as in operating time or blood loss. There has been a story like the less blood cell loss, less operating time, the I found absolutely in hardly any difference. post operative mobilization, again, there was a concern, but no difference. I start weight bearing as tolerated from the day next Absolutely no difference. And mind you, these five patients are very fragile. They are not the runner. They are not the marathon runner. They are just more or less at time bad bone, at time very fragile, at time previously prior to injury, they were walking walker or stick. So their mobility is anyways less. So post mobilization, the main target initially is they should go to the washroom with the help of walker. And gradually as the pain tolerate at the patient, they are going to be taper, uh, tailoring their mobilization based on their uh, pain. Of course, lesser composed of complication, perhaps, if done properly. Simultaneously, the DHS has survived, we all know, over the decades as a gold standard implant without any significant modification design. That is very important. That means it is a time-tested implant. However, uh, the dear PFN is keep changing. You get single screw, double screw, shorts, long PFN, helical blade, this and that, multiple variation. PFNA, PFNA2 kind of thing. There are multiple names and multiple jig, jigs. So you have to keep chasing them. So there must be something wrong with PFN. Everything is not rosy, rosy. 
That is the reason it is changing the design. When you talk of literature, it should not be only me supporting and advocating. The literature also should support us. As per the literature, if you uh, the review of your paper, all the stable trochanter fracture can be easily treated by DHS. It is a less expensive, however, it is contraindicated in reverse oblique fracture and large posterior medial fragments. Another study, it says the significant difference in outcome for unstable, but not for the stable fracture. It also says the intermediate device may provide stronger fixation, requires a shorter surgical time, causes less blood loss. Another very interesting uh, recent paper from uh, in Bristol, England, in JBJS 2019, it says the higher 30 days mortality associated with use of intramedular nail, 12.5% increase in risk of 30 days mortality. So that is also a point to ponder. So next is, after all this background, what are the few examples? 95 years old, young lady, with this fracture, very unstable, osteoporotic, uh, did a DHS, and fortunately, post operatively she behaved well, started mobilization. This was X-ray at three months. She was doing very well, no issues. Uh, another 100 years old young lady, similar, very porotic, have a look, grossly, DHS. So again, she was doing well, unfortunately don't have a follow-up x-ray. 72, gentleman, this is a fracture. Initial, I received this x-ray, had another x-ray again. This is the kind of story, had traction, internal rotation view. This is the x-ray, was obviously encouraged to do DHS. That's a post-up picture. 75 years old, female, trivial trauma. This is a cervical trochanter fracture with a Lesser trochanter off, post up x ray, DHS. Another patient, older fracture, treated using DHS. Another cervical trochanter fracture, x ray and internal rotation. This is check x ray of the same patient. Another patient had a opposite side PFN somewhere, this time did DHS. Another example of DHS. Another patient, interesting, recent past, just a month ago, had DFN already, this time it took into fracture. So obviously, removing the nail and putting a PFN is a big procedure for this old lady with multiple comorbidities. So I had to settle with the DHS, no regret. Lateral view, I was talking after lateral view, this picture may not be very from clear, but this is the distal fragment and that's a proximal fragment. All you have to do is just put a lever here, put another lever here, bring them to, together, put a wire that is going to be acting as a reduction wire and subsequently standard procedure. So this is a, another example of a lateral view. It can be like this and can be tackled easily and subsequent X-ray can be like this, like this. That's another patient six months down the line, walking comfortably, old lady. Another patient, unstable, intertrochanter fracture, treated by DHS. Another patient had a pediatric procedure somewhere, intramedial screws were there. Obviously the nail will not be able to negotiate very easily. So DHS is option. Another very unstable multiple fracture, greater to greater also broken. Internal, intraoperatively internal rotation view obviously was encouraging. Put a reduction guide wire and that wire has crossed the joint because I wanted to avoid rotation while inserting the triple rim or all inserting the screw. So that's the check X-ray. I don't think uh, I'm not satisfied with this. Another one had a uh, fracture of this inter the DHS again. Uh, this patient, though I'm not, uh, I won't advocate DHS for this, but unfortunately I was, did not have much of implant, but at the last minute I had to do in a different hospital, I didn't see the even patient. So DHS I did, but I was very careful not to medialize it further. Though this is not, this is lateral part is broken. This is not an indication for DHS. I ended up doing this actually, but subsequently post surgery it is obviously collapsed. There is a medialization, but patient is fine and she is happy and so am I. So not an issue at all. Uh, this is another fracture, grossly parotic bone. Greater trochanter is broken like anything. Last week only I did this, lesser trochanter is off. So intraoperatively when I opened the distal fragment, 
was literally bare type of uh, picture like the hardly any lesser token greater token is completely off this basic cervical type fracture lesser token is off so subsequently ended up having this picture and again patient started mobilization day one another fracture unstable dhs whereas i am not obsessed with the dhs for everything wherever there is a clear breach obviously the choice of implant would be pfn like here the breach in lateral wall pfn again there is a breach in lateral wall pfn that subsequent of the same patient there is some collapse subsequent back out of screw another breach of the lateral wall pfn this this would also ask for pfn so what is the extended use of dhs can be at time used for extended like pediatric uh, uh, this basic cervical fracture treated by this is a intercostal neck of femur fracture treated by valgus astatomy at time this is subtrochanter fracture uh, this is treated by intrafragmentative screw with the dhs uh, this is tsp in a case of uh, trochanter fracture with a reverse extension so tsp this is an interesting patient again i don't think the nail would have been an option here this is a old patient patient with a gunshot injury mal united shorten extended rotated completely limb with intercostal neck of femur patient and this time i had to do a corrective osteotomy with the dhs and everything was good another patient 3 months old fracture uh, neck of femur basic cervical i had to do valgus osteotomy and use a dhs so always it is not maybe not be reconstructable yesterday only i did this actually that initially i have shown the x ray that was completely resolved neck so i could not reconstruct so i had to end up doing the replacement so everything cannot be so rosy rosy as well there can be technical error as well again from the my cases the distraction more distraction actually this should be compressed actually and this is where as there is a medialization of the fragment distal fragment is medialized again slight varus reduction not a very classical again the varus reduction subsequently almost cutting out varus reduction not a good point again the medialized distal fragment this is important that this fragment the proximal fragment i knew intraoperatively it is rotated actually patient has healed subsequently is coming to my he is a young patient relatively is in 65 versus 66 but the whole proximal if you see there is a mismatch of the length this is not appropriate this is a rotator fragment proximally so you have to be careful so take home message pfn or dhs either may fail do a procedure which you are well versed with follow the basic principle get it right for the first time only first attempt should be the last time one both for the patient as well as for you uh, stable fracture can be treated safely by dhs unstable fracture dhs or intermedial nail either of your choice but if it is intact lateral wall i would prefer dhs still for me gold standard implant for a stable it fracture thank you thanks a lot